Uh, all right, everybody, thank you for, for joining us on this lovely day, um, for giving up a chance to be out a little bit in the sunshine. Um, but our special guest presenter today is Gina Maria Leo. Uh, Gina enthusiastically portrays Martha Wales Skelton Jefferson. This afternoon, she'll be speaking about founding father Thomas Jefferson's legacy and contributions to the, to the nation from his wife's perspective. So Gina, I will turn it over to you as Mrs. Thomas Jefferson. Thank you, and I'm very grateful for modern technology like Zoom to allow us to get together when you know conditions aren't allowing us to meet together in person, but I do hope we get to see each other again soon in person. But again, today's topic is going to be an overview of the life of my second husband, Thomas Jefferson. And the best place to start as always is in the beginning where he was born April 13, 1743, amongst wealth and privilege to Peter and Jane Randolph Jefferson in Albemarle County, Virginia. He was the third of their 10 children, eight of whom would live to adulthood, and they were Jane, Mary, Thomas, Elizabeth, Martha, Lucy, and twins, Anna and Randolph. Now his father, whom he idolized, was a surveyor who dies when Thomas is only 14 but not before ensuring that his eldest son receives the formal education he never received. Now, Thomas loved his early schooling, but then at the age of 17, he receives permission from his father's estate to move to Williamsburg to attend the College of William and Mary, where he quickly immersed himself in the city's social life. He loved socializing with friends, attending comic operas, and going dancing at the Raleigh Tavern. He would meet and befriend George with a prominent attorney, and at the college, William Small quickly would become his favorite professor. Now, both George with and William Small would be instrumental in getting him invited to dinner parties at the governor's palace, where he was to learn social graces, and where he sometimes entertained guests by playing his violin. He would begin to study law under George with and then pass the bar exam and become a practicing attorney himself, but also finding himself now well among, among the Williamsburg elite, he found himself elected to the House of Burgesses. Now it's 1770 and the Boston Massacre is in the news as well as the fire at the Jefferson family homestead at Shadwell. Now 27 year old Thomas would use this opportunity to move out of his mother's home and he would relocate into a one room brick building on the grounds where our budding architect was currently designing and building Monticello, and where he would continue to redesign, knock down, and rebuild Monticello for the better part of his life. He was also beginning to feel that perhaps he was focusing too much time on his career and not enough time establishing a domestic life. And by coincidence, as he is feeling this way, Word gets out that a beautiful and accomplished widow has just re-entered the social scene. So this is where I come into the story now because it just so happens that I am the beautiful and accomplished widow that everybody was talking about. Now there were now again, my name is Martha, but among family and friends, I was more commonly referred to as Patty. And I was born amongst wealth and privilege on October 19. 1748 to John and Martha Epps Wales at my father's plantation, The Forest. My mother dies shortly after I was born and my father would remarry and give, gave me three younger sisters and their names are Elizabeth, Tabitha, and Anne. At the age of 18, I married a Mr. Bathurst Skelton and within a year we became parents when I gave birth to a son we named John. But then the following year, Bathurst dies, and I am a widow at the tender age of 20. I moved back into my father's home, and now two years later, a certain redhead was about to enter my life. Now, there were other suitors, but Thomas, well, he made sure that I knew he was very interested, and he certainly stood out in a crowd at six foot two with his perfect posture, and well, maybe it was the red hair, but we truly enjoyed each other's company and we had so much fun together. And he loved that I was impulsive and vivacious and being well-read and educated, I was someone that he could talk to about anything, even politics. 
And we both loved reading together the Tristram Shandy novels that were so popular at the time. And we shared a love of music. I could play piano and he played violin. He even purchases a piano for me as a gift. I was also a favorite among the women of his family, which was no small feat. But I can tell you, ours was not a relationship of convenience. Ours was a relationship built upon love, respect, and admiration. He even anticipated becoming a stepfather to my son. But that would never be because John would die one year into our courtship. But then on January 1st, 1772, Thomas and I were married and we entered into a state of uncheckered happiness filled with much love and affection. We began our life together in that humble one room brick building that we would share until we moved into Monticello. And being an excellent housekeeper and household mistress, I gave him a comfortable, well-run, happy home where family and friends felt welcome. And as his wife, I gave him stability and serenity, and he appreciated me. Now, our blessings continued when nine months into our marriage, I gave birth to our first child. It was a daughter we named Martha, but she would be more commonly referred to as Patsy. Now, career-wise at this time, my husband was just a simple country lawyer dabbling in local politics, and he never had to travel far from home. Up until now, all was well because our quarrel with Britain had not become acute. But the tides were changing, beginning with the tea tax and subsequent revolt in Massachusetts, which began my husband's concern for preserving self-government within the colonies. In the House of Burgesses, he makes his talent known in the art of writing, and he gains recognition, particularly in 1774, by writing a pamphlet that would be given the title a summary review of the rights of British America in which he called for the rights of the colonists. Now our family on the, on the home front happily expanded at the same time when I gave birth to a second child. It was another daughter and we named her Jane. But sadly, we would lose little Jane in 1775. Now the American Revolution began in 1775 and my husband and I would work very hard to protect young Patsy from the traumas of the war. Now, he wanted to stay close to home, but was informed he had been elected to the Continental Congress. He had no desire to attend, but was ultimately drawn into public affairs by what he called emergencies which threatened our country. And upon arriving in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, he would quickly find a friend and mentor in John Adams of Massachusetts. His now 20-year-old brother Randolph, on the other hand, receives a different calling. Randolph Jefferson enlists in the Continental Army, joining a mounted unit called the Virginia Light Dragoons. Now, it's 1776, and my husband's mother would die from a stroke, and he himself would receive the first of many stress-induced migraines that he was to receive throughout his life. When he felt well enough again to attend, he would arrive in Philadelphia to find that negotiations with Britain were over and it was time to declare the colonies free and independent. And if we were to declare our independence, we felt that you know we should provide the British with a declaration that would list the grievances that led to this decision. Now, John Adams would choose my husband to be the primary author of this document and he would one day regret the day he did when this document becomes famous. What my husband wrote far exceeded what was expected, but it was what he felt. He was envisioning the possibility of freeing men from the constricting institutions of the past and to inspire men living under the burden of oppression and ignorance to open their eyes to the rights of mankind. Then Richard Henry Lee of Virginia would arrive in Congress to make a motion to have independence declared and July the 4th was the day that the wording of the declaration was approved of and it was sent to the printer. Well, as for its author, he is given a commission as a diplomat to France, but his term in Congress was over and he was not to seek re-election. He wanted to go home. Now, during the summer of 1776, Patsy and I were staying at the home of my sister Elizabeth, where I was recovering from an illness. 
At the end of that summer, my husband would send word that he would come to my sister's home and pick up myself and Patsy, and then the three of us would ride home together as a family. And where nine months later, I gave birth to a son. But sadly, the boy would die just mere weeks later. Our family, by the way, was living part of the time in Williamsburg, my husband having been elected to the Virginia House of Delegates. I may add that while politics was not something that my husband actively pursued, he did find it gave him a platform to champion causes near and dear to his heart, such as he did not want government to be run by a few rich and well-born men and wanted to make it easier for men from more humble origins to be able to participate in government. He would seek to establish public schools and public libraries, believing it necessary for the preservation of Republican government that all citizens be educated, particularly in the subject of history. He believed in complete religious freedom and he would author the Virginia Statute of Religious Freedom. And he was a firm believer in building a wall of separation between the church and state. And speaking of separations, he would be an early advocate for separation of power and also for representation by population and trial by jury. And speaking of juries, he would also seek more humane criminal law, believing in reformation and using the death penalty only for the crimes of murder and treason. He of course would seek to abolish slavery and he would write bills against, the, uh, against, the, against entail and primogenitor and he would seek to ensure the rights of the minority, believing that any majority in a legislative body could become oppressive in its treatment of others. So in 1778, our family happily expanded once more when I gave birth to another daughter, and this would be our Mary, but she would be more commonly referred to as Polly. And then in June of 1779, my husband was made governor of Virginia. And though he felt ill-equipped to be a wartime governor, he was honored to have been chosen and so he accepts the position. Now during this time, I kept busy with charity work. Ladies associations were organized in the states from New Jersey to Virginia to raise money and make clothing for ill-provided continental soldiers. The movement began in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania under the leadership of Esther Reed, the wife of Governor Joseph Reed, and in Virginia, at the suggestion of Mrs. Washington, I was placed at the head of the drive for funds. So I was a very busy woman during this time because I was head of this drive for funds. I was managing four plantations during a wartime. And I also gave birth to mine and Mr. Jefferson's fifth child in, in 1780. It was a little girl we named Lucy Elizabeth and she would be the only child born while her father was governor. But as was common in the time, we would also sadly lose this little blessing in 1781. Now in June of 1781, my husband and other senators were meeting in our home, Monticello, and the British made plans to ambush the politicians and capture Mr. Jefferson. Well, these plans were ruined by a man who was a hero in my book, and his name is Jack Jewitt. Jack discovers the plot and rides his horse throughout the night, arriving at Monticello just before sunrise with a warning. Now, my husband put myself and our two daughters in a carriage and evacuated us immediately, but he himself chose to remain behind until the enemy forces were actually within sight. But for leaving, he has been criticized for fleeing from the British forces, but I do think his critics forget he was very much a wanted man, considered a traitor for his role in the revolution. But there is an interesting story I do like to tell from this time when I can. It's that Bannister Tarleton, who was in charge of the fleet that came to our home, gave strict orders that Monticello was not to be damaged. And so for the 18 hours that the British occupied our home, not so much as one dish was damaged. Interesting. But it's 1782, and my husband's widowed sister Martha would move in with us with her six children. And her arrival couldn't have happened at a more opportune time because I was in the middle of my sixth 
and most difficult pregnancy. In May of 1782, I gave birth to a baby girl we named Lucy Elizabeth after her sister who had died the previous year. Now I was extremely ill and my husband couldn't have been more attentive. As a nurse, no female ever showed more tenderness or anxiety. My husband nursed me in turn with his sister Martha and my own sister Elizabeth, setting up with me and administering my medicines and drink to the last. For the four months that I lingered when not at my bedside, my husband was in the next room, writing so that he could come quickly if I should call. Then one day I began to copy a favorite passage from Tristram Shandy when I became too weak to continue. My husband found the paper and read what I had written, and recognizing the passage, he finished copying it for me. The passage reads, time wastes too fast. Every letter I trace tells me with what rapidity life follows my pen. The days and hours of it are flying over our heads like cloud of windy day, never to return more. Everything presses on. And every time I kiss thy hand to bid adieu, every absence which follows it are preludes to that eternal separation which we are shortly to make. And then on September the 6th, 1782, my husband records the saddest of all items in his account book. My dear wife died this day at 11.45 a.m. My husband's grief was so intense that he fainted, and he remained so long insensible that it was feared he would never revive. Ten-year-old Patsy, almost by stealth, would enter his room where she would find him emotionally prostrate. For three weeks he kept to his room, pacing constantly, night and day, lying down only occasionally. In October, he left his room and was constantly on horseback. To this, Patsy was his constant companion, a solitary witness to many a violent outburst of grief. My husband would destroy all of our letters together because our most intimate thoughts belonged to no one but us, and he was never to marry again. But he knew he had to move forward. He had three motherless children to raise, and he was determined not just to be a father, but also a mother, best as he could to our girls. To protect our family, he takes both Patsy and Polly and has them inoculated against the smallpox, and he serves as their chief nurse during the recovery period. And his friend James Madison was very worried about him and the depression he felt with my death and was maneuvering to draw him back into public life, believing it would help him deal with his grief, a grief that was more violent than anyone anticipated. And he was drawn into public life, and in 1784, he was given a commission as a diplomat to France, and then as we all know, he ultimately would succeed Benjamin Franklin as minister to France. His sister Martha would remain behind in Monticello, and believing that baby Lucy and six-year-old Polly still needed constant maternal care, he left them with my sister Elizabeth, believing it very important now that the girls remembered my family. He only travels with 12-year-old Patsy, and only after he calmed her fears over rumors she heard about the world coming to an end soon. He has to explain to her that such rumors had been around for a long time, and that no one really knew when the world would come to an end. So that settled, he and Patsy would travel to Boston where a ship would take them to France. And who should they meet up with at the docks one day but Abigail Adams and her daughter Nabby, who were both preparing to join John and John Quincy Adams who were already in France. And arriving in France, he would be reunited with John Adams and Benjamin Franklin. And he began to situate himself as a diplomat and set himself up with a household. And while he was busy setting up his household, he and Patsy would be daily guests at the home of John and Abigail Adams. And to thank them for their kindnesses, he would treat their children, John Quincy and Nabby, to visits to museums and the opera. Now as minister, when he became minister, 
he would negotiate treaties for whale oil, tobacco, mingle with diplomats, and he makes a three-month tour of France and Northern Italy, where he would witness firsthand the oppression of the peasant class, which only reinforced his Republican beliefs. Another concern was the problem with the Barbary pirates, and it is during this time in France that his notes on the state of Virginia would be published. He would be introduced to the court of King Louis XVI, and though not a monarchist, he finds he likes the king. He found him to be a good, honest man with no personal ambitions, and he approves of Louis's faithfulness to his queen. The queen, however, he does not like. He finds Marie Antoinette to be far too extravagant and felt that she exerted too much negative influence over the king. He would briefly join John Adams when John Adams was made minister to Britain to help him with his dealings with the British. And while they were in England together, they both would play the role of tourist and they would famously tour English gardens and they each would pay a shilling to tour the house where William Shakespeare was born and another shilling to see his tombstone. Now in personal family matters, he would begin to make plans to have our Polly join him in France when he learns of the death of baby Lucy from the whooping cough. But he is fearful to have our young daughter travel so far without him because the Barbary pirates were routinely seizing ships. But when travel conditions were good, she was soon on her way, arriving first in London where she's met at the docks by none other than Abigail Adams, with whom she would stay for two weeks. Our family now reunited. Polly would eventually join her sister, Patsy, where she was enrolled in the Abeji Royale de Pontimun, which was an exclusive and expensive boarding school run by Catholic nuns. But their father was assured it was the best school in the country. My only complaint is that during this time in France, Patsy, receives no formal training in household duties, which she needed to be learning at this age for her eventual role as a household mistress. But I do give her father credit because he does explain to her what she will need to learn once they arrive back home in Virginia. But it was while they were still in France that a now teenage Patsy Jefferson presents her single father with a different challenge. You see, she is entering maturity and her father knew he had to address the situation. He knew he couldn't keep her locked up in a convent forever, and so he began her gradual emergence into society. This began first with dinners at the table of her school, followed by dinners at homes of prominent friends, such as the Marquis de Lafayette, and from there he would allow her to attend genteel dinners and balls that met with his approval and where she loved the dancing. But he would only allow her to attend three balls per week to keep her grounded. He thought that was more than enough. And knowing Patsy's tendin tendency towards sloppiness and dress, because she was a bit of a tomboy, he would take her shopping for clothing to reflect her more mature status. And he makes it a rule that she be appropriately dressed as a proper young lady at all times now. Well, typical teenager Patsy hated being told how to dress and she does not like her new clothing. That is, until she started receiving many positive compliments from young gentlemen on just how pretty and ladylike she looked. So apparently in manners of dress, father really did know best. Now, after five years in France, Mr. Jefferson is preparing to go home to tend to his farming and finances. But our family is still in Paris when the storming of the Bastille occurred and Mr. Jefferson would go into the city to see the damage that had occurred. And our Patsy would be among the spectators when King Louis marched into the city. Now arriving home late in 1789, my husband would find that our Mary, our little Polly, was no longer happy with her name. In France, she had been called Mademoiselle Marie and she Loved that, but our, my husband did not, but her father did not think that would go over very well in our refined Virginia society. And so he suggests the name Maria as a compromise and she likes this. And so from that day forward, Mary Jefferson is now known as Maria Jefferson. And my husband had a fatherly duty to perform in that he gave our daughter Patsy, our daughter Martha's hand away in marriage to Thomas Mann Randolph. 
And then after marrying off our daughter and then leaving Maria behind with my sister Elizabeth so she could learn household duties, he would travel to New York City to join the new government as George Washington's Secretary of State. And then he would move with everyone to Philadelphia when it was made the new capital. And once he had settled in Philadelphia and was satisfied that Maria was performing satisfactory housework back in Virginia, he would bring her back to Philadelphia with him so that she could finish her city schooling. Now, Secretary of State, one of his duties was to issue patents, and he has the pleasure of issuing one for Eli Whitney's cotton gin. And as Secretary of State, as many know, he famously clashed with Treasury Secretary Alexander Hamilton. Now, my husband would retire from his secretaryship after one term, and he returns home to Monticello, where he begins to manufacture nails as a business. He also returned to a family that has now grown because our Martha was now a mother. And in one of his attempts at mothering, he would gift her with a book on childcare. Now, 1797, and my husband was a very happy man. You see, he had been nominated to the nation's highest office and he came in second place. He knew George Washington would be a hard act to follow, and he did not want to be president. But to his dismay, he finds himself to be vice president to a man he believed as much under Alexander Hamilton's control as he believed George Washington had been. And probably his biggest clash with President John Adams came when the president passed the Alien and Sedition Act. The Sedition Act, by the way, made it against the law to say anything negative against the government. My husband's furious, and with help from his friend James Madison, they retaliate by writing the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions which declared that the federal government had no such authority over the states. And they had to do this anonymously at the time, of course, because they both risked being arrested under the Sedition Act. But on a happier note, on the home front, Mr. Jefferson proudly gave our daughter Maria's hand away in marriage to Jack Epps. Now in the next election, my husband would confide in our daughter Maria that he wanted the job this time around because he was eager for this opportunity to bring the country back to republicanism, though he loathed public life. Now this would be the first election between two major parties, John Adams for the Federalists and Thomas Jefferson for the Republicans, and it was brutal. Both candidates would attack each other verbally, and Alexander Hamilton was doing everything in his power to keep Thomas Jefferson from winning. Now, in the end, John Adams lost his bid for re-election, and his friendship with Thomas Jefferson was shattered. But there was no clear winner because Thomas Jefferson was tied in votes with a man by the name of Aaron Burr. So it was now up to the House of Representatives to break this tie. Well, Alexander Hamilton, who maneuvered behind the scenes against Thomas Jefferson during the elections, well, now he maneuvered behind the scenes in support of him because, believe it or not, he hated Aaron Burr more than he hated Thomas Jefferson. So I just know at the end of all this, it was February 17, 1801, Thomas Jefferson was elected as the third president of the States United, and this would now mark the first time in our nation's history where power would pass peacefully and smoothly from one political party to its opposition. Your new president now had only two weeks to prepare for his inauguration, where he would announce his goals would be to reduce government spending, reduce government taxes, and reduce the national debt. Now, while waiting to move into the executive mansion, your new president was staying in a local boarding house where he continued to take his meals at the common table even after the election. And the executive mansion, by the way, was still under construction at this time. And I do have it on good authority that Abigail Adams did not like staying there because of that. But for a man whose own home, Monticello, was always under a state of construction, I think I could assure you that your new president probably felt right at home in his new lodgings. Now into his first year of his first term, the Barbary pirates were an early problem and he would send a military force to deal with them, bringing a temporary peace in the Mediterranean. 
In his second year, the U.S. Military Academy at West Point was established. And in his third year, he began negotiations with France to purchase New Orleans to gain control of the port there to ensure free navigation of the Mississippi River, which many of the states relied upon. But he soon receives word that Napoleon Bonaparte is willing to part with much more, the whole Louisiana territory. But he knew if he were to make such a sizable purchase that he would need permission from Congress. And for all the grief he gave the previous two administrations regarding the Constitution, he knew that the press and Alexander Hamilton would be watching that he follow procedure. And so he stalls for time. And while my very patient husband stalls for time, who should arrive on American soil but Jerome Bonaparte, brother to Napoleon, and he marries a girl from Baltimore. Well, President Jefferson was quick to invite the newlyweds to dinner at the executive mansion. And while my husband was famous for his informal dinners, the Bonapartes were treated to a much more formal dinner with the president himself escorting the new Mrs. Bonaparte into the dining room. And it amazes me the length my husband went to to keep Napoleon happy, considering he was a man he personally despised. But in the midst of all this, he's told by his advisors he needs to make a decision soon regarding the offer Napoleon made. And so in the end, fearing Napoleon would change his mind, well, for about three cents an acre, he more than doubled the size of his country, but more important, he now had control of that port. And as he predicted, Alexander Hamilton was quick to criticize him as a hypocrite. Now, soon after the purchase, he would send his personal secretary, Meriwether Lewis, and a William Clark on an expedition to explore possible trade routes through the new territory into the West. But the elation he felt over the Louisiana Purchase quickly ended early in 1804. Our daughter Maria had given birth to her third child and fell ill much as I had done. By the time he returned home, her father found her in a fragile state and he spent much time at her bedside nursing her. Maria Jefferson Epps dies in April of 1804 at the age of 25. Sadly, Maria's new baby would die shortly after her mother, making Maria's toddler son Francis the only one of her three children to live, making him all the more important to his grandfather being the only living link he now had to our lost daughter. Now, Maria's husband would remarry in time, but he remains very close to his former father-in-law and makes sure that Francis is a regular visitor to Monticello. And Maria's death would also bring a break in the silence with the Adams household. Abigail Adams would write to Maria's father to express her sorrow over the loss of the little Polly that she had helped care for those many years ago in London. But then three months after our daughter's death, my poor husband receives even more bad news when he receives word that his vice president, Aaron Burr, has killed Alexander Hamilton in a duel. Aaron Burr is not vice president for much longer. Now in the next elections, President Jefferson would win re-election by an overwhelming majority and into the first year of his second term, he receives news of Lord Nelson's victory at the Battle of Trafalgar. And he is elated when our Martha arrives for a visit, bringing all of the grandchildren with her. And she expands the family by giving birth to James Madison Randolph, the first child to be born into the executive mansion. And while she's in Washington for this visit, she will now temporarily serve as her father's official hostess instead of Dolly Madison, who up till now had been filling in for me because I was in the executive mansion, of course, in spirit only. Now, my husband once said of the presidency, no man shall ever bring out of the presidency the reputation which carried him into it. And unfortunately, too, he too would have this moment and it would come with the, with the passing of the embargo act which suspended all trade with britain and france 
and imposed great hardship on his countrymen. And it is a shame that his presidency ended on such a slow note because it did have its successes. Like the Barbary Wars and the Louisiana Purchase both were considered successes. And of his early goals, he did reduce government taxes. He reduced government spending. And with help from his treasury secretary, Albert Gallatin, he managed to reduce the national debt by one third. But it's now 1809 and he attends the inauguration of his friend James Madison and he is accompanied by our eldest grandson, Thomas Jefferson Randolph. And he's now finally able to retire and spend unlimited time with our family. And he is in his element playing games with the youngest members of our family. And he is thrilled when he is made a great grandfather. And he now has unlimited time to spend on his gardening and his farms. And it is during this time that he begins corresponding with and renewing his friendship with John Adams. And of course, the crowning moment of his retirement was the opening of his school, the University of Virginia. But now it's 1826 and his health is failing him. During the day, our daughter Martha would stay with him, but at night, he would only allow trusted servants and our eldest grandson, Thomas Jefferson Randolph, to stay with him. He suffered no pain and his mind was clear. His manner was that of a man going on a necessary journey. He was ready to die. He told Martha that I would be waiting for him and that she would bear and that he would bear her love to me. Now on July the 3rd, he awoke not knowing the day and said asleep again, awakening on the fourth. He fixed his eyes on family members and then ceased to breathe without a struggle at 11.50 a.m. His eyes were closed for the final time by our grandson. Now, as he wished, he was buried the next day without much fanfare. And when going through his personal effects, a folded paper was found in a desk drawer. Its worn edges proved it had been opened, read, and refolded many, many times. It was the passage from Tristram Shandy that he and I had written together, and within the folds of the paper was a lock of my hair. So, Thank you all very much for your time and listening to my story. And I do hope you learned a little bit something new today, perhaps about the amazing man, Thomas Jefferson. So thank you. <laughs> Mrs. Jefferson, thank you. That was an excellent, excellent program. Um, I didn't quite realize quite how busy your husband was. There was a lot in, lot in there that, that I learned too. Um, I did have, have one question for you. Um, I know you, you mentioned Abigail Adams a lot. Uh, Abigail Adams wrote the famous letter to her husband about remember the ladies. Uh, you mentioned um, fundraising during the well, during during Jefferson's tenure as governor. Um, did did you have any any involvement in in politics in in that same that same kind of way as an early early women's rights kind of sta standard um, as we start to move into Women's History Month? Actually, no, I did not. I was brought up very traditional in the Southern Virginia way. I was you know raised to be a household mystery. And so that's all I ever aspired to be. And I was very good at it. But I was a very calming force on my husband after all his busy days. Very good. That, that's fair. I think every, everybody needs some of that too. Um, oh, we have a, a little while here for any questions. If anybody else has, has any questions, um, I have been muting people as we were going. So please remember to unmute your, your microphone if you have questions. I um, have to state that I thought this was very informative. I did learn a lot about Jefferson, as well as you, and um, really enjoyed your presentation. I came to realize that it's the maybe the first time that we never had a first lady in the office, uh, with Jefferson being president, except this, as you mentioned, and I believe uh, you were saying that Dolly Madison would step in. Could you elaborate on that part of it? Yeah, because every president does need like a, a hostess whenever dinners were held. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't there. His good friend and Secretary of State James Madison, or his wife Dolly Madison, since they were good friends, she just stepped into the role 
of hostess in my stead to help him out. Mm -hmm. He did get a lot of help from family and friends, knowing he was very much a single father and never mm -hmm. remarried, and he did need help on some, some ways. <laughs> yeah, and, and you know, I found that amazing. I never realized, at least I don't know going further on, if there, I think we always had a first lady, but that was interesting. I never put it together. And um, I, I was impressed what a family man, um, man he was. I mean, I didn't really learned a lot about him, you know, so I thought you were great in Thank presenting you. the whole I thing. Try to educate people, realize you get a bigger picture of what he went through publicly, but also, you know, privately as well. And when they combine. So. And his dedication also not to remarry. I mean, that, I guess he was truly, truly in love with you, not to yeah. remarry. Because in our days and in Virginia, where the way we were raised, the man was the breadwinner, the woman stayed at home to raise the children and run the household. And by not remarrying, he had to juggle all of this on his own. And as I mentioned, family and friends stepped in and they did help him. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. You're welcome, thank you. You're welcome. I have a question, if you don't mind. Uh, do you know if Thomas Jefferson had anything to do with trying to get King Louis the Sixteenth out of France during the French Revolution? If he tried? No, I'm not aware of any of that. I do know that once that all the, the the revolution started happening, he was very much firmly grounded on American soil, and he was basically more interested in American interests at that time. Yeah, I, 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 knew, I knew he was back home, but I didn't know if he was trying to use any kind of like political influence in trying to get King Louis the Sixteenth out of there before oh, that whole thing happened. No, all that just it took its course over there. <laughs> gotcha. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you again, Mrs. Jefferson, for, for joining us. Um, we have a slightly belated celebration of, of President's Day this month. Um, but thank you for for joining us and for for sharing your story. I think I think everyone has learned a, has learned a lot. Um, as we move into into March for our next series, um, we're embracing Women's History Month next month. Um, but we actually have a theme of history of women in media in Scranton um, on March twelfth. I think is the date. Um, we'll be speaking with um, we'll be having a, a featuring a, a program about the female founders of WYOU, the new station in Scranton. And then on March 26th, uh, we'll be joined by Tina Lesher, uh, who was the, one of the early female reporters for the Scranton Times in Scranton. Um, she'll be talking about the Scranton news, newsroom and news scene um, in the 1960s. So those are our, our, next, our next programs. Um, again, same bat time, same bat channel. Um, at 2 o'clock on Friday afternoons on Zoom, um, we will email and Facebook post the links. Um, and once again, Mrs. Jefferson, thank you very much for joining us. Um, everyone else, have a lovely weekend. Um, I hope it's still sunny, at least a little bit, where you are, um, and enjoy a, a lovely weekend. Thank you. Thank you, too.